Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I'm your host, Alan Moore, and today I'm excited to have XYPN founding member Mike Solari, founder of Solari Financial Planning, on the show today. Now, I've been hearing some feedback from XYPN Radio listeners that they wanted me to spend more time talking about the guest's business and not as much about their career path, and Mike was incredibly open to doing so. You'll have to let me know if you prefer this format over the other. Mike really opened up about how much money he spent in the first year of business, how much he made, how he took a loan from his parents to start the business, how much money he had saved in the bank, and more. Mike started his business at 29 years old back in 2013, a year before XYPN even existed. He had a bit of a, in his words, slow start, but things have started moving much faster. Four years in, he has around 28 clients on retainer, and he shared his average revenue per client. And if you do the math, he's making over six figures a year now. He's also charging $300 a month for financial planning for new clients and talks about the types of clients and services he provides for that fee. We also talked about his biggest successes and struggles, which I think listeners will find helpful as you consider starting your own firm or working through whatever it is that you're currently struggling with. As always, you can find any of the additional resources that we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 111. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYPN radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Mike. Hey, Mike. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for being on. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. Good to hear from you. I'm very excited because as a founding member, we have, you know, there were only 30 founding members, so we are slowly sort of moving through the list of the originals. Maybe that should be the name, the originals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) That sounds more, sounds more superhero then. (laughs) With the folks that that joined in, you know, April and, and early May of 2014 and have been with us over three years, which the really interesting thing to me, or I guess the cool thing to talk about is the fact that Almost all of our founding members already had businesses in place. They did not literally start with us because they, you know, if they were going to be joining at that time, they they already had a firm in place. So I'm excited to sort of explore how your business got started, why you joined XYPN, why you stayed in XYPN, and, you know, basically how business is going. So we can do a quick sort of summary of your career. So take me back and tell me a little bit about how sort of, how did you get into financial planning? Why, you know, I guess, how did you find this career? I tell people when I talk with them, I always enjoyed, you know, personal finance and, and my own. And I think a lot of people, you see a lot of people blogging mm-hmm. about it and, and trying to pay down student loan debt or whatever issues that they have. So I've always enjoyed kind of that, that area in finance, you know, and even in college, our college was across the street from one of the big Fidelity headquarters. And so, you know, they sponsored one of our classes to get that series seven brokerage thing. And I was like, oh, this is sweet. You know, I'm going to take, oh, you know, past the- yeah, so I so you know got past the exam. I'm coming out of college. I have my series seven. I think I'm gonna be you know, I don't know, running the show somewhere, right? <laughs> right. You know, it was a lot of sales. And if you know me well, I'm not a, like a big sales guy. I'm somewhat introverted, you know. And so that whole thing of asking for you know my parents to manage their money or, or my or my friends who have student loan debt, you know, it just wasn't flying with me. So I kind of went in a you know different path. And then in 2009, I got laid off from an analyst job that I was I was at in Boston area, and I was moving back home to to New Hampshire. And I kind of rekindled. It really, you know, getting laid off kind of like made me really think about what do I actually want to do when I grow up, type of thing. Sure. You know, I started looking into financial planning, and I actually did speak to someone in New Hampshire, you know, who talked about fee only planning, and that just kind of like opened my eyes and kind of really like blew the doors open of what I really wanted to explore and do. And this, it got me really excited. Just the problem is there, you know, a lot of them were one or two person shops up here and no one was hiring. So I went through like the list of the NAPFA list of, of advisors in the area and try to chum me up with them. But I eventually landed a job with a fee based firm. And so at least at that point, it was for me to kind of just to get to know the business, you know, doing, 
the nitty gritty stuff, right? Paperwork and onboarding clients and kind of going through that whole process. It was a, it was a very good learning experience, but that's where I started, you know, learning about that and how to manage some money and, you know, how to actually do a little bit of financial planning and stuff. So that's kind of where I got to that. And then, you know, why I broke off was just, you know, I wanted to do in a fee only area, you know, I wanted to work in that space. And the only way to do it was to do it, you know, on my own. You know, it's fascinating. I did not know that some of the broker dealers were paying for Series 7 for college students, which, you know, it sounds like, oh, yeah, they're just doing that. But like, that's actually very impactful in terms of the career direction people go, right? Because after you've studied for the Series 7, you've gotten it, you're either going to go work at Fidelity or you're going to try to use the thing that you spent so much time and energy getting. Mm -hmm. And it really can set the career path, which, you know, is, is unfortunate that they just broker dealers are so much larger than fee only or fiduciary based, you know, platforms that it's it's just not, we're just not competitive enough yet, but yeah. I think we're headed that direction. But the other thing you said was, was about talking to a fee only planner. And, and I talk to planners all the time and they just say, Alan, I want to have an impact on the profession. Like, how do I have an impact? What organization do I join or what politician do I call? And, you know, really may, maybe my answer should start being just like, talk to young people mm -hmm. about what fee-only planning is. Because if every fee-only advisor out there talks to one you know, young person a quarter, four lunches a year, how different would our profession look whenever we can actually just sort of share what it is that we do? Because I, I think that until you've experienced it, it's hard to describe what we do. I agree. And I, I tell people too, like, cause I, when I was looking for, you know, trying to get into a job, I mean, a lot of these NAPFA members were more than welcome to have coffee, you know, more than welcome. Yeah. And I tell people, you couldn't do that at a Morgan Stanley or at Rich. <laughs> right. you know, it's like, they're not going to open their door, you know, and they open and they're, they're like an open book. And it was great because especially when I was starting to go on my own and preparing for that, you know, I was asking questions about compliance and, you know, how they're charging and, and things like that and, and contracts and stuff like that. And they were more than willing to share that information, which was awesome, you know, so I agree. I think it's great that, you know, if, if we can at least talk to some people and give back, I think that makes a huge impact on other people. Yeah, I know folks tend to get hung up on, and I think it's a great thing to do, like go to speak at the colleges and things like that. But those are heavily guarded. You know, it's a bigger ask actually to try to get in with the student associations and things like that. It's just like when when people call, just, just pick up the phone. And, you know, honestly, that's how XY Play Network came about was because when I was starting my business like you, people picked up the phone when I called. And I remember conversations with one that sticks out in my mind was with Jude Boudreau mm -hmm. and just talking with him because everyone was telling me it can't be done. It can't be done. You can't start your own business. There's no way you're mm -hmm. 25. And Jude was one that actually gave me some helpful feedback and encouragement and said it could be done because mm -hmm. he probably started in his late 20s or early 30s. Mm -hmm. And so I committed that when people called, I would pick up the phone and Fortunately, I'm a loud mouth at conferences, and so a lot of people were calling. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that, that's sort of where XY came from was, was a way of leveraging up the information. But it's a major impact that we can have, I think, that that I, I think we think of as just like a small thing. But I hear all the time, you know, hey, I, I just got an email actually yesterday from a guy that I had lunch with like three years ago, and he's like moving his family and starting a business. And, and I didn't mean to do that. It was just being, you know, having that conversation. So mm -hmm. not to harp on it too much. I do think that that's a powerful way that we can move the profession forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So tell me about sort of your last job before you went solo. So you, you ended up in a fee-based firm or sort of a fee yep. and commission firm as we're trying to start calling them. Yep. So it sounds like you were very much in like a paraplanner role. Were you did you move up there into sort of doing, you know, I, I, being the lead advisor? Did you get that level of experience there? I guess just sort of what, yeah. what was your job there? So I came in, it was like a paraplanner role when I came in. And so they, they called it a little bit differently. It was a quote unquote independent firm. Their broker dealer was NFP Securities. So, okay. so it was fee and commission. And so when I came in, it was paperwork. We used e-money, you know, which was pretty fairly new at the time. And so, you know, I would be inputting all that information and preparing it for the advisor, for the lead advisor and preparing all that. And then I did work my way up to, you know, quote unquote, like a junior advisor role. Mm -hmm. So I was meeting with, you know, we, we tiered the, the clients 
you know, A, B, C type of clients. And I, I started working with the C clients, so to speak, right? So they had some money, but not a ton that were managing. And I was going out and meeting with them and, 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 re, and doing like the whole meetings and, and preparing for that and got to that role. When I decided to leave, it was because my compensation, and I totally get this from the advisor's perspective, you know, if I'm going to pay you, I'll pay you a little salary, but it's got to be more performance based. And, 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 I, and I totally got that. But it was, it was a hard decision for me. Because I, I didn't really believe in selling, you know, the two guys that ran it were essentially old Northwestern mutual guys. So they had a lot of, you know, whole life policies. They were big on selling long term care and and I'm pushing a lot of that stuff. And so it got to the point where, you know, I can make some decent money, but I don't feel right putting these people in certain products that I just don't think that, you know, they need to be in. Yeah, the path to making money. <laughs> yeah, and and if I and if I want, I know, and if I want to build my own business, which was you know a real goal before I even landed there, how could I sell someone of that and then try to convert them over? You know, and so when I got to that point, for me, it was let's let's try it on my own. I'm gonna leave with no clients. I left with no clients, and I started from scratch because I just didn't want to get to that point where I was you know, telling them one thing and then, you know, really believing in another. And I just didn't want to get caught up in that. And that's kind of where I made that decision where I remember sitting with my wife and I said, at the time we, we didn't have children. I'm like, we don't have kids, you know, we don't have a lot of expenses. You know, I know there's a demand for it because I've, I, I just know, you know, I just remember speaking to people, a lot of it, a lot of people just get investment management. They don't get the planning. They don't know if they're ready for retirement or they don't know if they're doing the right things. It just there was just that that piece to it, and I you know kind of went and that made that decision out there to 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 go on my own at that point, and so the the whole compensation kind of pushed me a little bit further and faster than I probably would have been. Yeah, that's interesting. That you know, had you been a, a appropriately salaried employee that just had you know expectations of of managing relationships instead of getting new ones all the time or selling mm-hmm. products, it you yeah. know your career path could have been very different. You. You mentioned one thing in there, and I do want to to point this out just for our younger listeners, because it took me years in the business to try to, to figure out what this meant. And that was when you said your firm was independent. Mm-hmm. And I hear this all the time where I said, you know, I'm an independent financial advisor. And, and you'll hear people say, oh, my advisor's independent. He's with Edward Jones. And in my head, I'm just like, no, no, that's mm-hmm. not what we mean. Or, or an right. independent, you know, of Raymond James or whatever. So and, and admittedly, like it's just funny how they how these terms get used. But do you can you explain the difference to me around like what's the difference between being an independent office that is associated with a broker dealer versus how you and I would use the word independent to describe our practices? Yeah, so we called ourselves independent because even though we were tied to a broker dealer, you know, essentially we we could make decisions on what type of products. Now we only had a select few things that we could. You know, the broker deal would definitely kind of filter out mm. all the products that are out there. They provide us a list and we could go and do what we want. We didn't have pressure from anybody above to sell certain products over another. They just had the list that we could provide and we can go out and do. So for us, you know, at that point, we're independent, meaning that we could select from that small list, but we weren't have <laughs> pressure. Right. So like I've heard stories with Edward Jones and, you know, this quarter, it's this, or, you know, you got to be pushing that or, you know, and so there's less independent. And, you know, I don't know, I've seen a ton of Edward Jones portfolios. And if they're putting people in mutual funds, it's it's American funds. It's always American funds. It, it is so easy to yeah. spot right. an Edward Jones right. portfolio. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I know they, that, that maybe they do call themselves independent, but I wouldn't consider them necessarily independent because it really is, you know, they're pretty much all standard. Whereas right. they have a little bit more flexibility with that, with, you know, working directly with some type of broker dealer. Yeah. I'm trying to envision, like, I wish I could come up with another industry that does it this way, because what we're talking about where if you were not independent, more captive, it's like owning a subway, right? Like subways are independently owned, yep. but you don't get to like create new subs. You can't create a new soup and start serving it, right? It's yep. all very controlled. So I'm not sure the like the less controlled franchise version of that in other industries. But I, and I do think it came out of some advisor saying like, look, either you give us more control or we're just going to go do it ourselves, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think the broker dealers had to start giving some control while again, 
you know, not not just opening the floodgates and saying, sure, sell whatever you want, because, you know, many broker dealers prohibit certain fee structures or certain products or very much certain technology and that sort of thing. So, but it's an interesting delineation around using the word independent. And this is a problem in our industry. Obviously, we like to use words to confuse people yeah, yeah. and just use the same word over and over and mean 14 different things. So in our world, independent means we have to follow what the regulators say. But short of that, like we just get to do what we feel is in our client's best interest. Mm-hmm. And there's no other parties involved in those decisions or filtering or anything else other than being sure we're doing what's legal. Right. So you made the decision to start your own firm. So at this point, how old were you? 29, I think. 29. 29. Okay. Yeah. So uh, usually starting a business when you're 29 is considered crazy. Crazy. Yep. <laughs> Any, yep. Anything with a two. And, and I just turned 30. Didn't you feel like so much more mature when you were 30 instead of 29? Oh, yeah. I don't know. There's something about it, like this expectation of wisdom or something. That and body aches and, you know, <laughs> recovering from the night before on a Friday night, you know, it takes longer, you know. Oh, my like, God. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Go for a hard night and it's like, oh, no, I'm never doing that ever yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So did it primarily have to do with timing? Was that really the drive? Like you knew you wanted to do it, but you know, the timing just worked out well that it would be easier then than doing it later when you're yeah. trying to transition all your clients. I think it would have been really hard to kind of move those clients over. And I kind of created some type of like business model trying to figure out exactly how much money do I need to kind of support a business and my, you know, and my personal life, right? And what what it would take? How many clients do I need? What do I need to charge them? Kind of like you know, and try to start thinking about like that process. Mm. You know, I had saved up a sum of money, like a decent money that I had, and then I got a loan for my parents, which was just for my personal expenses. Like, so I just I wanted to separate that. So I said, this is a loan that I get for the first year, and then I had to start paying it back the year after. So I started paying back in like sometime in 2014. Yep, and. But that that kept me afloat for my personal life, and then I had my savings, which I had saved for for this. And I figured, what kind of inv- <laughs> it's probably a crazy investment, but you know, I'm going to invest in myself, and I, I really believe that there was a market out there for that. And that's why I jumped on the Garrett Planning Network. At least I'll get some referrals coming in from there to start doing projects for pre-retirees, and that's how I just started, you know, pulling that out. Yeah, that, that's. Awesome, because that that was similar to my story about you know sort of taking out a loan from the parents yep. to just to keep the lights on because it is amazing yep. you know people get very obsessed over well should I spend thirty dollars a month on my CRM or should I wait and I'm like mm-hmm. what's your rent yeah like, right. what's your personal rental payment because yeah. that is what will kill you not necessarily whether or not you pick up a CRM so but you you were married at the time so was your wife yeah. working and and providing income or yep. was that not there. Yeah, yeah, she is. Uh, so she's a dental hygienist. So she worked, and she still works. You know, today. Yeah, she was part of the puzzle, right? So, you know, with her, you know, she was able to help support at least the first, you know, year or two while I was still kind of getting everything together. And not only that, but also emotionally. I mean, there. I, I tell people, it's just it's, it can be such a roller coaster. And you get higher highs and lower lows kind of running a business, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when that first, I I remember to this day, I was so nervous for the first prospect. Oh, I had a few prospects. I swung and missed, you know? And then I remember, you know, talking with the the first people that I signed up, but I figured that they were going to be like, yeah, well, we need to talk about it and this and that. And they... They're like, no, let's, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's move forward. And then I'm thinking, maybe I didn't charge enough, you know, and you're kind of like going through all those things. But but it's a great feeling. You're like, I remember calling my wife. I'm like, I got somebody, (laughs) you know? And, you know, that was great. I think that was just awesome. And yeah, she's been awesome and wonderful and very supportive. I couldn't have done it without her, certainly. Yeah. and, And folks have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. If you have a significant other and they are anti you starting the business, do not start a business <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because something will give. I mean, one of those pieces will probably not make it, but you just cannot be successful in your business if you don't have that person at home that, that's able to support you because it really is a roller coaster. Yeah, And it's we say that a lot. Maybe we could explore what that means because it's hard to describe. I, I feel like it's hard to describe the roller coaster without having been on it. Mm-hmm. Because, I don't know, it's hard to prepare for it. I don't know if you can prepare yourself for it, but what you can do is have the pieces around you to be sure 
Mm -hmm. that you're okay when, when the roller coaster happens. Yeah. Yeah. I remember talking with uh, my wife's name is Tracy. I remember talking to Tracy and it's just, she knew it was something that I wanted to do and the direction I was going. And she just told me, you know, listen, like you said, we we don't have kids at at that point. You know, if you fail, you, you can find another job. I mean, you have that experience that you can go. And she's like, you know, it'd be tough to live with myself knowing that I was the one that stopped you from doing something that you wanted to do, that you, you know, that you had that passion and drive for. And so, like I said, I can't, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her and having that support. And, you know, she's been, she's been awesome. And I totally agree. It's just, it's, it's tough if you, got, if, you know, the couple's not on the same page and you really need to have that, you know, you need to have that going in the same direction. Definitely. So talk to me about sort of the the early stages. I guess, how long did it actually take you from, you know, I'm going to do this to, you know, actually launched and meeting with those prospects? How long of a process was that for you? Yeah. So my decision was the end of 2012. So I, I got like my CFP in October or whatever that 2012. Yep. So once I got that, that made me more marketable to people. So I felt pretty confident about that. So I started preparing for everything towards the end of the year. And then it was in February, going on vacation with my parents. So wanted to, we were down in Florida, kind of got all my ducks in a row. I got the LLC set up and everything like that. And oh, actually, let me, let me think of this back. So I actually told my advisor before I went on vacation, because I wanted to give him a heads up and say, listen, this is what I'm planning to do. I'm willing to, you know... Like I get it if you if you kind of let me go immediately or whatever, you know. And at the time, you know, he was looking to move investment platforms, so you know we had a lot of paperwork that we had to probably get through, mm-hmm. and a lot of clients and stuff. Like that. I'm like, listen, I, I'm more than welcome to help you like get through this because for me, I knew that you know if I can get a little more income and try to work maybe part time or something to make it work. And he's like, yeah, oh, he's like, you know, go on vacation, that's fine. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss it when you get back. And then yeah, I got a text message. The Sunday night before I was supposed to go into work, saying that that I was done and please don't come in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> everything's man. been changed. Yeah, so I was like, all right, well, I guess <laughs> I was a little behind everything. So it was at the start of March. I think that w- that's what it was. The start of March is when I was officially unemployed and I had to, you know, get everything squared away. So I filed my ADV with the Garrett template in early March, and. I didn't get improved until May, mid-May, and I was so afraid to call the compliance officer, the state. Yep. Heaven forbid they know you're there, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone's like, well, you got to be careful with them. You don't want them to like slide you know, your file underneath a stack. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Finally, another advisor, another NAFA member is just like, no, call them. This is ridiculous. He's like, you know, you, and I did. I called them. I was just like, hey, I just, just checking in. I mean, I just want to make sure you guys got all my stuff. And they're like... Oh, oh, okay. And then literally one week later, it was approved. I think it just sat on someone's desk and, you know, sat there for a while. But in, right. you know, so it was in May, I got approved. And then I was, then I joined NAFA like around that time as well. And then honestly, my first client was probably in July. So it was, it was pretty dry to start, you know, it was tough. But I was at the time, you know, trying to just network with state planning attorneys, CPAs. And NAFA members, but I have to tell you, the NAFA members have been were awesome for referrals. At least when yeah. I first started, they they were great. I mean, you know, they don't fit your client model, and they a lot of them don't necessarily fit my model now. But at the time when I'm doing projects and just trying to get some income, that definitely helped out quite a bit. It's huge, yeah. And and that's it's the hard thing to describe, I guess. And, and we we continue to try to do a better job of explaining like the first few months are going to be slow. You know, the, unless you're bringing business over, which, you know, certainly some folks do where they, you know, they bring in, you know, they're, they're bringing 20 million AUM over or whatnot. But if you're just starting out, like it's going to be a bit of a grind. So early on, you know, you, you said you were starting a business with no clients. So where, I guess, where did you find those initial prospective clients? Were they friends and family or did you have some sort of network or did you really just go out you know, really hunting for them. Yes, it was. It was not friends and family. Definitely not my friends. The way I got the clients was they started coming in and started dripping in through Garrett Planning Network. So being part of like the, some of those organizations, you know, helped feed that. So it was NAFA and it was the Garrett Planning Network that, that really started coming in and started trickling in at that point. 
and then other NAFA members. That's just where it started coming from. I still get decent referrals through NAFA, you know, being part yep. of that organization still, still kind of drips in and stuff. So that's kind of where it started to come through. I, I you know, honestly, I've never, so I still meet with the state play attorneys and I, I try to, you know, network them. I haven't really got many referrals from them at all. I think a lot of them are trained to, at least in my area, to sell to, you know, to, to refer to the, you know, maybe the larger life insurance company because a lot of these mm. people need life insurance and stuff. But, right. You know, that's been tough. And then CPI has been decent for me. So that's just, I don't know. It's just who your, where your area is and some of these CPAs get like the fee only thing, you know? And so that, that's, that's slowly starting to pick up, you know, at the end of last year, I started getting some decent referrals and even to this year. So that, that takes time. That took a long time. Yeah. I actually think it's funny that attorneys do not seem to get the fee only message, fiduciary focus message. Like, and I don't know if it's because they just can't comprehend that, someone would possibly not be a fiduciary just because, I mean, they, they just don't live in that world where that's even a possibility. But I do think it's interesting that I don't hear a lot of folks like, oh yeah, I get great referrals from estate attorneys unless they're doing just, unless, you know, they specialize in super high net worth folks. I don't know why, but it is good to know that at least when I was in and, and you were in, and I'm assuming this is still the case, you know, Cheryl has done a good job of getting out into the media and, and bringing awareness to, to your network. I mean, she's been doing it for I don't know when they were founded, probably 20 years now, mm. that would be my guess. So I had definitely built up a lot of goodwill, you know, around the fiduciary message and hourly and things like that. And, and so they are able to to drive leads, NAPFA more so, I think. And are you noticing, I have heard some people asking lately if uh, NAPFA redid their website in May, are you noticing a downtick in that or has it been pretty consistent? I guess it, we only have, you know, three months of data at this point, but. Yeah, I have to say my summers are, are, Dip, I get a dip anyways in the summer, so I couldn't be able to necessarily tell. But I, I get, and it's it's weird because it's hard to tr- say like, you know, getting it directly from the finite advisor email that you get from them in that mm. portal. A lot of people will go there and then they click on your website and then, you know, then they might schedule a call from the website or something like that. So, right. you know, Hunter so it's I like, did. yeah, so it's like, oh, well, I think they do their research. A lot of people that I've, that I speak to, have gone like they they've really understand the fee only model. They kind of get to that point where you know, they've read about it, they've done a little research about it. They probably went to Napa and then they visited your site and maybe some others, and then and then that's when they've contacted you. So for me, it's kind of hard. You know, a lot of times they're like, "Oh yeah, I just did an internet search." Yeah. Like, well, I'm yeah. doing the internet, like yeah. oh helpful, <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. So I'll, I'll keep investing yeah. in that internet thing. That's great. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> It, it it is funny. Every now and then, someone will say, "Oh yeah, I was googling like this exact phrase, and you popped up." Like that. That's actually very helpful. Thank you for yeah. that information. Yeah. Oh, I wish I got some of that information, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be sweet. And Google has been limiting the amount of information we get from there from keyword. You know, they don't tell you what exact keywords anymore. Really, they they've sort of backed off that. But so. All right, so let's talk about sort of your first year. What do you do you remember off the top of your head sort of what your planned expenses were versus sort of what your expenses ended up being? I'm just curious how much you actually ended up spending in that. Yeah, what year. I spent. I can think about that. So Garrett Garrett was expensive. I don't know what it was it is now and how they structure it, but I think it was that that was like five thousand dollars up front and two hundred dollars a month is what I paid. But yeah, I remember it's thinking it's actually more now. Huh? Is it more? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, they, people can look on their website. I think it's around, I don't know, uh, thirteen thousand in the first year or something like that. Like oh, no it, kidding. It's, it's not a small. It's not a small chunk of change to spend. Yeah. So so, but I thought about it. I'm like, you know, that's two, three clients, you know, projects yep. or something like that that could pay for the initial fee, and then, you know, so so that was my biggest expense. I probably paid twenty twenty five thousand dollars at least in my first year. And so that's like the, the Garrett stuff, doing the website and branding and all that stuff. Some of the rent. So I have like a Regis type of thing. It's called mm-hmm. a little bit differently in my area, but it's, it's essentially, you know, setting up and, and paying per, per visit and stuff. So I had, I had that. So I probably, you know, twenty twenty five thousand dollars is probably something that, that I paid. I think I made like only $11,000. So I think I was like negative nine for the year. When I when all but came you in, you got yeah. started halfway through the year, so that exactly was- right. It wasn't a full okay. year. It wasn't a full year. So it was, a, and I expected that though, because that's why I had that I had that cash build up. So I had a large sum, a 
a, de- a decent sum. So when I say that, I probably had like $35,000 of, of savings that I had saved. And then okay. my parents lent me, borrowed 20 grand from them, which I'm almost done paying back. But yeah, so so the 20 grand was just for my personal stuff. The 30 grand that I had was for operating and just getting this whole thing going, you know? And then I, I think I spent some money on compliance because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I was spending a lot of time trying to figure it out. And I'm glad I did that. <laughs> <laughs> just went ahead and hired somebody. Yeah, I was like, I, need, I don't, you know, contracts and all that stuff that needs to get squared. I'm like, I no, no idea what I'm doing. So, it's, you know, like a lot of that, there's a lot of startup stuff that you got that you got to go through. And yeah, you know, and just money to be spent. And that's, you know, I, I know we've, we've been guilty in the past. We, we talk a lot about our, you know, first year budget. You can start a business for 10,000 or less. And that is true. It does require, you know, making some sacrifices, sure. but most folks we find end up in that twenty to twenty five thousand range just because the the type of business they're building mm-hmm. necessitates that. So if you said like, yeah, I want to work from my home part time, all virtual, like working with you know this particular demographic that I already sure. know, like the way you would have spent money would have been different. So I can go ahead and give listeners a heads up that we're actually going to be releasing a new first year budget projection. So we've we've had one in the past that sort of showed lean. Mm-hmm. startup and that was truly bootstrap like 10 grand we are going to be showcasing sort of the different layers of spending that you can do as well as some different firms that have been built that are a few years in the business that have been built differently mm-hmm. to understand how that initial investment sort of leads to the type of business that you want to build yep. again with some of the expensive decisions like software in particular you know we've got some folks that go out and buy orion you know it's uh, retails fifteen thousand yeah, dollars yeah you know, you're you're only going to do that if you're building a certain type of business, which obviously greatly affects that first year outlay versus folks that say, "Yeah, I'll just grab Blue Leaf or Capitec or or I'm not going to do anything because I don't yep. do investments." So, yeah, I guess d- did you sort of find that like w- was that top of mind for you that money that you were spending was building a certain foundation, or was it just sort of like, "Yeah, this is what I feel like I need, and I'll figure out sort of the longer term vision later." Yeah, Garrett had a, a pretty good like database of what people are using, what are they doing, how are they starting up, what is this, that, and everything. Basically, what the XY Planet Network is kind of set up as yeah. now. And so I would just, you know, try to figure out what what's the consensus of this or that, and what CRM system do I need to be using, what what financial planning software do I need to be using, and, and going in that direction, and then buying it. And then I really, honestly, like for me, was trying to get out and just... Because I saw the value of other NAFRA members sending me stuff. I would go to... Anyone that would want to talk to me, you know, I would drive. I remember driving a couple hours, you know, hour, hour and a half to certain advisors way up north just to talk to them. <laughs> just to talk right. to them, you know, and going up there, taking them out to lunch and just seeing what they had for input. And, you know, for me is, you know, yeah, I wanted to get referrals and stuff. But anything, any tidbit I could get and walk away with that I could input into my business, you know, that to me was valuable. And so I was out there trying to just do that. And, you know, so, so those are part of the expenses too, is just constantly going out and just trying to network and just trying to meet people was like a big thing. Yeah. Cause especially if you do like FPA events and things like that, I mean, they're not free, even, you know, the luncheon right. would be 50 or 60 bucks. And yeah. having run some of those now, I promise they're not making money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just covering costs, but it, it is hard in your first year to spend money on things like that. And, and I guess knowing your, knowing what you're good at, because I think that is a great way for some people to network. It's it's not ideal for others. Right. So it sort of depends on on your personality and if you're getting things out of it, but mm-hmm. can definitely see that that's a line item. And, and it doesn't have, I mean, it's not thousands and thousands of dollars, but you know, being realistic and putting in maybe a grand or something like that for your first year would be huge. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that you went in, you talked to these NAFA firms and just trying to learn, were there any tidbits or tips that you got from them that you can sort of remember now that have had an mm. impact on the on the way you've run your business? I mentioned that, that I spoke to someone and they, they turned me on to what fee-only planning is. And it's yeah. an advisor up north. He's not even really involved in NAFA a lot, but he's got his own practicing up north but like just sitting with him like had me vision where do i want to take the practice so we we talked about you know so what are you charging you know how much should we be charging and how many clients should you be having and we really just talked about like you know where you you ought to be right don't be gun shy about you know selling your services so low because if you think about and project it out right let's say we can only have 100 clients right and you're only charging maybe 100 dollars a month you know you've got 100 grand gross right 
Yep. Like what like what do you want to earn? Like how do you, you know? And so we kind of like backed into a lot of that stuff and we just talked about like where, you know, what where, you know, what kind of income should you be doing and what you should you should be focusing and and stuff like that. So that that was really helpful because we did really just just talked about it and he he was great. You know, we talked about the different type of investment management stuff and you know, charging a percentage versus, you know, flat fees and stuff like that. And so that was extremely helpful. Let's see. I, I, a lot of a lot of people were just very supportive, and uh, I remember someone on the Seacoast area, in New Hampshire. They they sent me their their contracts, their you know their templates, you know questionnaires. I mean, they just they just sent me all that stuff, which is great because I could just take that, tweak it to whatever I needed, and, and put that. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, Things copy thousands of dollars on, <laughs> right? Take copy and repeat, you know, it's just like, you know, use that and leverage everything. But like I said, I'm, I, you know, a lot of NAFRA members are very helpful. And, you know, so that, that just was, that's probably really the big stuff that I think I, I pulled away from yeah. some of those, those chats. You know, the way you framed that was really interesting around, you know, projecting out long-term the effect that undercutting your pricing will have on your business. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something that, I mean, we, we're constantly harping on advisors. I know when you first start, you want to charge 50 bucks a month, but like you can't run your business that way. Yeah. And I, I just got done listening to the documentary about Warren Buffett with his book, Snowball. And his big thing in life and the way that he built wealth was he always, I think he hundred x his money. So he said like $50,000 a day is, you know, $50 million in, you know, 60 years with a rate of return I think I can get. So like every dollar had a bigger impact. And I'm not saying advisors need to think of it quite that extreme, but like $100 versus $150, whenever you project that out of a lifetime value of that client is a huge number. Mm -hmm. So what your client will hear a a $50 a month difference, you should be thinking a, you know, tens of thousands of dollar difference Mm -hmm. because that's what, that's really going to be the impact Mm long-term. So how have you, well, I guess let, let's just get sort of an update on the business. Where do you stand today with sort of number of clients, AUM, overall revenue, sort of where, I guess, where's the business today, basically four years in? Yeah. So most most of the revenue, probably about two thirds of revenue is made up of monthly retainers. So that's the majority of the income. I probably have about, well, I'm waiting, waiting for, for a couple of people, between 24 and 26 people on monthly retainers. Okay. I think I'm averaging... On a month to month basis, this is going to go up two thirty five or so a month, you know, per okay. client. So yep. I, I'm hopeful. I'm trying to just increase it. And I I, t- I talk about like you know the first person I took on, I charged him a hundred dollars a month, and he goes, "I'm just going to write it." Is like I don't want to pay this every month. I'm just going to write you a check. And then at that moment, I knew that I was undercharging. Right? I mean, he's just yeah. like, "I'll just pay it all in full." So I started at 100 bucks a month, and I already raised his fee. You know, after the first year, I'm like, yeah, let's let's go to 150. And he's like, all right, we're we gonna keep doing this. I'm like, well, <laughs> we'll just do you for now. So, but I look at it, and I'm like, it's really hard. It's it, it's doable. It's definitely doable to raise your monthly fee with people. Yeah. Once you get that relationship, is definitely it's hard because it's more hard on the advisor, I think, because you just you don't want to ruin that relationship. I think clients will definitely see value in it, but I just think that's hard. You know, I think like raising and getting that fee, you know, to something a little bit more sustainable. And, you know, I'm hoping, you know, trying to get it to an average of close to, you know, 275 by the end of the year and, and keep going. But so is that just monthly fee or do you, do you charge an asset under management or an investment fee of some kind? So I just charge. So most of the stuff that I have, a lot of the clients that, that I'm taking on don't have investments to manage. They're maybe small IRAs or it's made up of all their 401ks. So I don't, I don't manage the money. It's just a flat fee. I charge an upfront fee between one to two grand or so just to, to start the work. And then, you know, 300 bucks or so a month to do that. There are some people, I do have two clients that I manage money, you know, and that's uh, between the two clients, that's, it's about a a million dollars between the two. And so for me to manage the money, I I need like to make it worth my time. I think like, you know, 300, $350,000 or so of assets to manage would make it worth worthwhile. worthwhile. Because you got, you know, you got other stuff going on. There's other compliance to deal with and things like that. And so I tend, so I have, so the monthly retainers are typically younger clients, although there are some older clients that I have mm-hmm. that just are pretty pretty good do-it-yourselfers and just very hands-on, but want someone to be there. 
so they don't screw up, you know, type right. of thing. So we have that type of relationship. And then I do, you know, and then there's that other close to a third or so of hourly, like project plans that I do for a lot of, they tend to be engineers, software engineers that come in and they're in their fifties and they need a plan. And, and, and that, you know, can range from two to three or $4,000, you know, for a plan. That's, yep. That's probably what I'm charging around. So you have the the two clients that you are managing money for. How are you handling that? Are you at TD Ameritrade or are you Betterment? Like what, I guess, how, how are you managing those clients? So I'm at Shareholder Services Group okay. and that's where that's I started. So when I first opened my practice, I didn't manage any money and my focus was just getting people in the door and that happened to be one-time hourly plans. So but I, I made a decision. I'm like, well, eventually I want to manage money. So why not just have it in my ADV so that I can do it? And then it's like, where do I want to do it? And I, I talked to other advisors. They had very great experiences with SSG. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to call them and see what happens. I did talk to TD. This is before the XY yeah, yeah, uh, relationship. <laughs> so, I was, you know, they're like, yeah, so you need like $7 million to bring on. What's your game plan in the next six months to bring in you know, $7 million? I, you know, I was like... I'm dead, dead in the water right now. <laughs> There's no way. So I went with shareholder and they've been great. So yeah, yeah. SSG's wonderful. Yeah. And so that's that's where I have it at this point. And maybe at some point I change it, but you know, wait until I get a little bit more assets under management to make a decision. Absolutely. So three hundred dollars a month is, I guess, is on the higher end of monthly fees that I hear mm-hmm. about. So I guess what do you sort of have a typical client that's coming in and paying three hundred bucks a month? Because I mean, thirty six hundred a year. If you use my rule of thumb of one to two percent of income, that means they're making somewhere between one hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand, like in you know gross income. Is that typical? Yeah. So yeah, my focus has been so the, the way I have 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 come down on this monthly retainer model is that they need some type of income to support it. So the clients that I'm typically working with. Are making in the realm of two fifty to upwards of you know four or five hundred thousand dollars or so, and so a lot of them are physicians I work with, so you know that might have dual incomes or single incomes, and then there's other engineers that I do work a lot with, so they might have income coming in from restricted stock units or other stock options that are coming in, and so you know there's there's complex ways of going about and and divesting that. So so for me, like those are, you know, that income that the level is probably where my sweet spot is and where, you know, why I'm charging that amount. I've had people and I've definitely had people drop off. So I'm not going to, you know, sit here and say, you know, and, and in this year I've already, I had three people had dropped off for this year, but that's because it wasn't a good fit for them. You know, the model, they probably should have been a one time. Their incomes mm. weren't supportive of the fee that, you know, could have been there. And so gotcha. I, to me, I look at it and I say, that's a good thing for the model, right? So if we're charging a flat fee with AUM, you know, if they keep saving the money and the markets keep going up, you're going to get an increase in pay with the monthly retainer. It allows you to shed some business that, that might not be a good fit. Although it worked out for the time, it might not be working out for today. And so it lets you shed a little bit of business and focus on maybe more clients that might fit that model, you know? And so I think that's a good aspect of, of this monthly retainer. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, you know, you benefited from this. I I very much built my business on the back of referrals. I'll say cast offs from NAPFA members, you know, for folks that just didn't meet their minimums. I'll never forget the day I got a $400,000, you know, AUM client because they were too small for the advisor down the road. Yeah. And of course I'm like, you know, jumping up and down on my couch. Yeah, right. But I'm so excited for the day that like, we're big enough as a network and our advisors are successful enough that, you know, you're basically fueling the growth of another, sure. you know, XYPN member in your area because, I mean, yes, they, they may not be a good fit for you or they may not be a good fit for long-term planning relationship. But if it's the former, then, you know, there's a, another advisor out there that has a personality that may be a better fit. You know, I I could not work with engineers. I mean, there's just no way. So like I could fuel, I could fuel you with lots of engineers. If those are the type yeah. of people you enjoy working with, I just don't. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's always interesting to see sort of what people enjoy, you know, what they're good at and, and that sort of thing. So you're at 26 clients sort of four years in revenue. If I'm doing my math right, I mean, you're, you're north of six figures now. Mm-hmm. And so I guess what is the, 
sort of what's what's the outlook? I guess where where are you hoping to take the business over the next twelve to twenty four months? And you know, I guess how will the business change in order to be able to accomplish those goals that you're looking to accomplish? That's a that's a very good question and one that I've chatted with another advisor with a lot. You know what to you know, and a lot of other people. But like, where 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 do you want to do with this? Do you want it to be a lifestyle practice, or do you want to actually build a business? And I, I think, you know, for me, you know, a lot of the effort and time and stress that I've put into this, it, I definitely mm-hmm. would like to make this more of a business. So I think, like, you know, thinking about just continuing to grow, you know, bringing on whether that be more monthly retainers or you know, assets under management, and just continue to grow and you know, talked with other advisors about, or another advisor about potentially merging or seeing what, you know, what that would look like. And so that's just, oh, sure. because I, it's a lot, and it's probably normal, but in my state, it's, you know, we're one of the oldest states in the country. And a lot of the advisors here are very old. And so mm. they're looking to merge or sell their practice out of necessity versus, you know, having that desire. And so for me, when I'm thinking about, it, I don't want to be in that position. I think there's a lot of positives that you can leverage by merging potentially. And so thinking about it now, I think is is can be extremely helpful in finding that right person because you know you can really kind of make it, and it might make it a little easier to you know once you merge to maybe bring on somebody as a you know associate planner or something like that and kind of grow it. So it's just trying to figure out those pieces. Right now, the 12 month is to really kind of just keep grinding and keep bringing in more business, more clients and servicing them. But in the long, long-term plans, it's trying to figure out what pieces do I need? What people do I want in my practice? And, and how do I make that work? Yeah, it's always interesting as you as you approach the do I want to grow and have to hire or do I slow down at some point? And it'll be interesting to see, you know, where folks decide, because I do see more, you know, well, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say more. I, I think it's interesting to see that, you know, that that sometimes can change depending on where someone's at, you know, in their business and just how long they've been doing it. If they're getting lonely versus, you know, thank goodness I don't have to manage people to sort of depends on their, on their attitude. But mm-hmm. Do you see yourself merging if you were to go that route? Have the have the conversations been more with younger advisors or has it been more of a older advisor? I'm going to take over your book of business. So less merger, more takeover than, you know, looking for an actual partner. It's actually not more partner, younger advisor, someone, right. someone similar to my age and my, someone that's at the similar spot that I'm at, at this point with the, with the business. Cool. Yeah. So it's, if I were to take someone that's you know a little bit older, I mean, I'm looking at clients that are probably retired already. To me, that has less value than merging with someone that has a lot of clients that are in their 30s and 40s. Right. There's a lot of longevity working with someone a little bit similar age, and then you know we're going through a lot of the same growing pains. We're going through and having a lot of the same type of client questions and issues and things like that. And so we can really focus on that type of clientele versus. You know, having one section of the business be for thirty and forty year olds versus you know <laughs> yeah. sixty year olds and what they're going through. You know, yep, that makes sense. I and I get the attraction of taking on an older book of business, and I know that XYP members are probably going to get more and more opportunities for this mm-hmm. as the profession continues to age, and there are not a lot of young planners to take over that book. But not all young planners are excited to take on a book of older clients. Yeah. It, at least it gives you that base, right, of revenue yeah. coming in, and it can do that. But then you know you have to deal with the other stuff that comes with it too, right? So yep. it's, it's a tough decision. So what would you say has been your, I guess, biggest struggle? You know, you're four years in, so so theoretically you're you're through, you're past the gap. Someone the other day said between between starting a business and success is more door. And so I, I, I have felt that way that, you know, you just, you basically hit hell for a while. So I guess what, what has been that Mordor or that, that struggle for you in getting things going that you've had to overcome? Yeah, I, I think I mentioned a little earlier in the podcast that I am kind of introvert in nature. So I've never been the one that just going out and selling myself has been super easy, you know? Mm-hmm. Getting the clients, you know, we've definitely, I've done a, a really good job at least getting people to, to call and to have the meetings and things like that. 
But having that sales process, at least initially, was really tough for me. I'm trying to figure out exactly how do I go about getting them to close. So a lot of people, you know, when I first initially met, you know, they're they would say, ah, maybe we'll, we'll get back to you. And it, it would lead to a longer sales process. And I've really worked hard to kind of speed that up mm-hmm. and trying to close sooner. You know, I think that's probably one of my biggest weaknesses at that point is, is that whole, like the front of the business as far as, you know, getting people in and actually like, you know, converting them. So that was definitely kind of a struggle. Yeah. So I think that's probably one of my, my bigger yeah. weaknesses that, that I've struggled with, but, you know, I'm continually looking to improve myself on that. Have you done any sort of sales training or, or one of these various courses that, you know, gives you a onboarding process or communication process or anything like that? I have. Yeah. So I've done some sales training and I've been through a couple of different courses just to kind of get an idea of what to do. And then I'm kind of in something like that. Recommend? <laughs> no, well, you know, so <laughs> the one that I'm currently in isn't necessarily a program. It's It's another advisor that's kind of taking a few other advisors and mentoring us a little bit. Mm. And so that has been extremely helpful and they've been very great at like kind of sharing their sales process and, and stuff like that. So I think that has really been very impactful, but like, as far as like, I don't know, just, I know that you, you, you guys are a relationship with somebody. I haven't, I haven't looked into it too much, but, mm-hmm. but the ones that I've been through, I just think they're just too general for like the whole industry. It's not really any very specific on how, you know, you got somebody in there that's maybe a Gen X or Gen Y client. What, what do you need to adapt for that? Makes sense. So I, I guess the the flip side to, you know, struggle would be successes. So what I guess what do you attribute your success at this point to? I mean, you've built a you've built a business that, you know, what is it, twenty percent of businesses make it five years. Mm. So you're you're approaching that five year mark. And so you're gonna beat out eighty percent of businesses that didn't make it. So I guess what which is a huge accomplishment. You know, I, I think that's awesome. So what it's what do you attribute that success to? What have you done right that that you'd recommend others do in, in sort of learning from what you've done? Sure. Well, honestly, I didn't really think about that. They made it five years and eighty percent. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's pretty wild to think about that. But what have I been successful at? I, I think like you know, hanging in there and and just continually to grind. And when I say that, you know, having that grit to continue to go out there and making sure, you know, bring in those clients, you know, pitching them and then servicing them like hell, you know, making sure that they're completely satisfied with what you're doing because you are like these, you know, being a feeling advisor. I mean, I don't know what the percentage of feeling advisors is to the rest of the industry, but there's a small percentage and you're already providing way better service and, you know, for your clients than any of those other advisors. And so you got to, you know, I just keep in mind that like that drive and having that grit to continue to go and just keep going on because you're going to eventually build that book of business that you'll get to that point where you're satisfied. But it's really, you know, just making sure that, you know, you lose a client, it sucks, but like, let's move on. Let's, let's go on to the next thing, right? Let's go to the next close or the next call or whatever it is. And that's what's merely driven me is just, you got those high higher highs and lower lows, but you know, let's let's try to, you know, keep keep going on so that you get more of those higher highs and that you're you're sustainable and and that's what it is. Is for me, sustainability was met, you know, a couple of years ago and then we, we had our first kid in two thousand fourteen and then, you know, and then we got more expenses to go on, right? And and so I just gotta sure. continue to drive and then we just had another kid this year. So for me it's like, you know, we gotta continue and for me it's just I don't know. I, as stressful as it is, I love that having that drive, mm. you know, and, and and that motivates me to continue to try and bring in more clients to tailor what I'm doing and to making sure like what my clients are doing, the service that they get is is exceptional. So I, I did not realize that you had had a, a, another kid this year. So congratulations yeah, thanks. on that. Thanks. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like throwing a wrench into starting a business. Tell me that about it. a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess, how are you balancing that? So two little ones, I guess your first one, what, it is either about to turn three or already is three now. So a three-year-old and a under one-year-old, how are you managing life, you know, the crazy concept of work-life balance or work-life harmony? Yeah. How's that working for you? So it's been great because, you know, I have that flexibility in my schedule. You know, my wife works four days a week. So she, you know, one day off that, that, that can kind of help in, but, you know, daycare, you know, we, you know, we leverage that. I, I can't, 
I thought I'd be able to work, you know, like I have, I have my kids like on some of those days that daycare's off, like Martin Luther King and, you know, mm-hmm. President's Day and some of those, those holidays. And, you know, I think I can get some work done, but the reality is I, I cannot get any work done. This is virtually impossible. So, you know, we're proponents of, you know, having, you know, leveraging daycare so that we can focus on, you know, that business. But, but being able to tailor my schedule in case I need to take them to a doctor's appointment or, you know, or to go and do whatever. And so there is that balance there. And then if I need to do work on weekends and, you know, my wife take them, then, you know, we do that too. We kind of just make sure that we're making sure I'm getting my work done, but also spending enough time with them. Yeah. I, and I don't mean this to sound as it, I don't know. I don't know how to say this without sounding rude, but like, I don't know how people that work nine to five and don't have flexibility have kids. It's tough. I don't know how you do. I don't know how you get them to the doctor's office or handle daycare when daycare is not in our school. Like I'm so spoiled by the fact that I can just sort of work whenever I want to work. Right. And so I don't know how you do that. And, And I know that there are a lot of younger planners out there that will say, you know, Hey, you know, I, I can't start a business yet because we're going to start a family. I'm like, do it now. So you right. have the flexibility to That's enjoy what I your did. family. That's what I did. Because, you know, I thought, you know, if we fail, it's just the two of us. You mm-hmm. know, if you start out and, and, and fail and you got two or three kids, it just makes it tougher, you know, and I think it adds to the stress. But, you know, but if I succeed, you know, then I got, you know, we got, I can support a family, you know, before we have them. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think, you know, going out and doing it maybe before thinking about that, it adds definitely this level of stress, but you, you can start building it now before your kids come and then you'll have that flexibility, you know, to be able to take that time when you need it to spend with them. Because depending on where you live and and what your income is, I mean, I, you know, if you're making 50 or 60,000 as an associate advisor, obviously making 250,000, this is a little different, but if you're making 60 K, you should be able to get there in three years. Yeah. I feel like just in building your business, depending on a lot of variables, but you know, two and a half, three, three and a half years, something along those lines. So if you're looking at having kids, you know, a few years out, like you probably will be able to replicate your income if you're in that level within a few years. Yeah. If you're making 250,000, it's going to take a little longer or you be bringing over some business or something like right. that or have some sort of plan. But right. I totally agree. It does provide just an extra layer of flexibility, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But so I guess as we're sort of wrapping up, I'll, we'll, we'll sort of end with the question and that being if there's, you know, one thing that you wish you had known, I guess one piece of advice that you wish you could go back and give younger Mike, what do you think that piece of advice would be? Yeah, this is, a, I guess maybe it's kind of a, a catch 22 for me, but I talked about like the sales process. I wish I maybe had just a little bit more experience drowning in like, you know, cold calls and mm, rejection. Yeah. <laughs> just like getting beat up before, you know, before you kind of go out on your own. And because for me, I look at like those failures and then you call them failures, but like, you know, things that you don't close or, or whatever, you don't succeed at as things that you can look back and seeing what you would need to improve. Like when sometimes when you get successes, sometimes they're, they're, it's by luck. And so you don't know if you did the right thing or not, but you got them anyways. But for me, I wish I, because I remember my old boss gave me a list of prospects that had already said no to him. Oh, funny. Call. Yeah. So I remember that. And I was just like, would just be staring at that list in the morning and be like, oh, I don't want to, you know, it's just, this is going to suck. But I wish I got a little bit more of that just because it's when you're going out, I mean, there's a lot of like operational stuff you need to take care of, compliance and all that stuff. But really like making the clothes is a huge, huge part. And I think like if I got beaten up a little bit more, I think I probably would have been and jumped it a little bit quicker initially. Okay. Yeah. And I, it's such good advice. And in the things that, again, sometimes we get so caught up on like, did I select the right technology? Should I get this, yeah. you know, spend this money on this marketing system and all of that. And And in the end, like, I think, I mean, one, you can't just sit around and wait for the phone to ring, but two, like you've just, you've got to be able to close business. I think it's, it's a critical thing. I read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad way back in the day, but I remember the one thing he talked about was being a vacuum salesman, you know, and it was like, if he could learn how to sell vacuum cleaners, he could sell anything, which is probably really good advice Yeah, right? (laughs) that most of us that didn't come out of 
insurance or whatnot, we've probably never been through a sales course. Right. We've never had to actually sell planning. And selling it is very different than delivering it. Right. Absolutely. So, well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and being so open about your business and how things are going. I'm so excited to see you continue to grow in your success and, and you know, watching as you continue to scale, bring on, you know, new employees. I think the next year or two is going to be a ton of fun for you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it. It's great talking with you, Alan. It's good to hear from you. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYP and radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes with myself and Kitsis, and to finally find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients. 